Hi, welcome to our midweek Bible study. It is the 23rd of February, 2022. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 3. Have your Bibles. A um, couple of prayer requests. You do want to pray for Esther and Marlena's sister, Netta. Now, Esther had lived with her for quite a few years, and they were pretty close and, and are close. And Netta has been uh, in serious condition in the hospital with COVID. Her sons also have COVID, but she's on a respirator. And uh, we've been praying for her, and, and she was uh, not expected to make it uh, till today. And then yesterday was a big day for her. So there has been some improvement. And so if you would just pray for Netta, pray for Esther and Marlena and the family, Netta's children. Uh, Rick's Anderson surgery went well, uh, so that's good. Uh, Marlena is scheduled for surgery on March the 4th. So we want to pray for that also as it gets forward. Also, if you if you remember the Asbury family who lived in our community for years, went to our church for a while. Uh, and if you knew Jeff, Jeff has passed away. And so be with his uh, wife, Ina, and daughter, Doni, as they mourn over the loss of their father and husband. So um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your throne that we can come to. And Lord, we certainly... Um, reach out to you, Lord, in a time of need, and we pray, Lord, for Netta. We need a miracle, Father. We need uh, you to do what the doctors cannot do, and, and that is to revive her uh, flesh and her body. We just pray for Marlena and Esther as they continue to pray for you. We ask your will to be done in this situation. Thank you for Rick's surgery that it went well. Continue to pray for Marlena as her surgery is upon her. Lord, and we just pray, God, for Asbury family. Just give them comfort. Bless our study today, Lord, as we look into your word in Jesus' name. Um, we're in 2 Kings chapter 3. In, in chapter 2, uh, we did see the um, a whirlwind of Elijah taken up into heaven, and Elisha is now taken upon his mantle. And we start with a guy named Jehoram. Uh, now, Jehoram is the son of Ahab and the brother of Ahaziah. If you remember, Ahaziah was removed from his throne in uh, 2 Kings chapter 1. But Ahaziah, not having any children, uh, the throne wasn't given to his brother. And so uh, we kind of ended that in chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, we, we moved to the story of Elijah. And now we are going to be looking at uh, back with this king of Israel, the northern king. And it's Jehoram. It's the son of Ahab. He became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. If you remember, Jehoshaphat helped Ahaziah with the battle that didn't go very well. Ahaziah kind of dressed him up, and Ahaziah, Ahaziah tried to become... Uh, unknown to the enemy, the enemy shot a random arrow into the air and it killed Ahaziah. And so Hosaphat went and uh, tried to help, but um, uh, God had other plans at that time. So now we have Jehoram as king at the same time as Jehoshaphat. This will be important in a second. So they did evil. He did evil on the sight of the Lord but not like his father and mother, for he put away sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. So we have this fellow who is better than Ahab, better than his brother probably, and did do a couple of good things. He put away the, this, this pillar of Baal, but he didn't destroy it because it shows up later on. But he did kind of get rid of it for a while. And, and that was probably out of um, fear. He had seen the work of God and, and what happened to his brother. And maybe he just superstitiously feared it because he did keep the, uh, the worship in the hills going on and, and did follow in Jeroboam's uh, decree not to go down to the temple and worship. Well, he wasn't perfect. He, he still was evil in the sight of God. 
and just not as evil as as Ahab was and, and very few kings were. Um, so then we are introduced to Misha, the king of Moab, a sh sheep breeder. And he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and wool and 100, of 100,000 rams. But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So Misha is king of Moab. Uh, what's interesting about this guy is, is there is a, you can Google this if you want to, uh, but there is an item at the Louvre Museum. Um, is that right? uh, but it's, it's called the, the Misha steel or the Moabite stone and it's on display. And it was discovered uh, around 840 BC. And uh, this particular event that we're gonna talk about probably happened around 870 BC maybe. And so here's what the, the steel, it says about the, the Misha steel uh, that was discovered by archeologists. It says the Misha steel known as the Moabite stone is a, uh, a steel or a rock with carvings in it, dated around 840 BC, containing significant Canaanite inscription in the name of King Misha of Moab, a kingdom located in modern Jordan. Misha tells how Shemosh, the god of Moab, had been angry with his people and allowed them to be subjugated to Israel. But at length, Shemosh returned and assisted Misha to throw off the yoke of Israel and restore the lands of Moab. So what we do with that, that stone is we see that um, archaeology, history, and the Bible all connect because the Bible is not just a book of religion. The Bible is a history book. When we're reading about Jehoram and we're reading about Ahab and we're reading about Jehoshaphat and we're reading about Misha, there is uh, archeological evidence that these things were real. And that on this Moabite stone, it actually talks about their God being, it's, it's their side of the story, that their God is so angry that they were subjugated to Israel. Well, the truth is, is, is they were enemies of God. And that's what, there is no Moabite God doesn't exist. Uh, so as we read through this chapter, we know we're reading a historical account of the relationship between Moab and Israel. And at the time of Ahab, Moabites were subjugated. They brought these offerings. But when he died, the king of Moab decided, well, you know what? It's time to stop this being oppressed by these people. So King Jehoram in verse six uh, went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. He went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are and my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Then he said, which way shall I go up? And he answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. So Jehoram needs help. Um, again, because he's the younger brother of Hosiah, um, he may not be a military guy, um, but he doesn't really know what to do. He doesn't have the same fierceness as his father. And he does uh, something his brother did. He went down and went to Jehoshaphat, who helped before. Now, Jehoshaphat helped before. God protected him. He pointed Ahaziah to uh, God's prophet. Ahaziah said, I don't like that guy. He's always doing negative prophecies about me. And we talked about that in chapter one. So here comes Jehoshaphat. He agrees again to help. And, and he has a heart for Israel. He has a heart for the entire nation. I think Jehoshaphat would like to see them united uh, under the, the leadership of God. And so, but what you do want to see is, is that um, 
when the world needs help, they will turn to you. And, and we can be ready to help. We can be ready to step in. And uh, Jehoshaphat was. This is the second time we've seen him do this. Um, so then verse 9, we see it interesting. The, the king of Israel went along, uh, went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. Uh, now, we did read before that Edom had no king. So this would have been uh, a leader of Edom. And they marched on that roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army nor for the animals that followed them. And so now you have an interesting kind of uh, Lord of the Rings feel. You have a, a three kings from different areas. You have the king of Judah, the king of Israel, and the leader of Edom. And they are united under defending themselves from a common enemy, the Moabites. And to me, this is a real picture. You know, we talked about three kings that came to Jesus. Well, these three kings, well, and we'll just call them three kings. Um, I think they represent three things to me. Uh, Edom represents the world. And the world sees some personal gain by connecting themselves to religion. Um, and we see that in, in presidents sometimes in, in their kind of phony religious speech where they can't really identify books of the Bible, but they really need the Christian vote. They, just, they try to pander to the Christian. And we got to listen to what they say and, and know where their true faith is. If you know your scripture, you can, can see where they're kind of off and, and they're kind of pandering. Um, but that's the world. Um, I see that, that, that Jehoram represents religion. He's got his false uh, he's the nation of God. But they're not following God. And so these are people that, that look for God in the wrong places. He has rejected the temple worship and, and, and had a form of religion where uh, I see Jehoshaphat representing the body and the church of Christ. And, and that's where we are. We are surrounded by religious people who are way off track. And we're also surrounded by the world who wants nothing to do with God, the Edomites. And, and we're right there with them. And, and sometimes you work alongside with them. Sometimes you're on the same team with them. And sometimes we are, are in the same family with those who are either following false religion or following nothing at all. And here we are in the midst. Of it. And it's always going to be that way. And But we are the salt and the light. And we carry the truth. And we carry the ability to go to the throne of God and pray. And so we, we have a purpose. Go, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus said, uh, when questioned about why he was eating with a certain uh, class of people, you know, he said, well, the, the well don't need a doctor. So I'm here to, to reach out to the sick. And so are we. So we're going to be in the midst. And here's Jehoshaphat. And if you look at verse 10, it says, The king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. So we see that with the world, false religion, that there's a lack of hope there. You know, he doesn't have that assurance of the scripture, assurance of the Bible. He just figures, well, we're just here to die. We don't have any water, no food. Uh, the cattle, it's just, we're just going to die. And there's no doubt about it. But there's where we come in. Look at verse 11. What Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here? that we may inquire of the Lord by him. So one of the servants of the king of Israel said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. So now Jehoshaphat, this is where we, as the body of Christ, can point those who are, are, are without hope, without uh, strength, without direction, and we can point them. And, and Jehoshaphat says to uh, 
Jehoram, who is, we're just going to die. This is going to be terrible. He says, wait, isn't there a man of God we can talk to? Which is the same thing he did in chapter one. Um, the response of Isaiah was, yeah, this guy, but I can't stand him. I don't want to talk to him. You know, he says negative stuff. But this answer was Elisha. They say an interesting thing about Elisha, that he is the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And that's a picture of the servant and washing the feet and washing the hands. It's just his servitude. We see a little bit about his reputation as a servant of Elijah until it was his time. Um, but Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. They didn't call him. Usually a king would say, go get me this. They humbly went to him and they found him and they went and inquired of him um, very humbly. This is a lot different than, than chapter one in which Isaiah was, was against this man of God and Adam in prison. And, and even though the prophecies of this this prophet came true this is a little bit different we see here that that god is going to um work through elisha and and jehoram does not fight against it he, he goes and does this um so let's go back and we'll look at um How this plays out. And again, the, the lesson really here is this. Jehoshaphat has done this twice now, in which he's called for someone to go get the man of God. And the first time in chapter, it wasn't met very well. It was kind of fought against. And in the second time, uh, there's a little more willingness. And so we get to verse 13. Elisha says to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. And so he looks at him and he says in verse 14, Elisha said, as, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. And so I want to talk a little bit about this. This is kind of the key of this whole chapter. Um, he looks at him and says, what have I to do with you? Now, this reminds me a little bit of, of Christ, where he says, you know, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And so he, it's not that Elisha is unwilling to respond, but he is giving him uh, a dose of guilt because here now, you know, it's it's this idea for Jesus with the feeding of the 5,000, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Or he says to Peter, you know, if you don't let me wash your feet, you got nothing to do with you. Um, he tells the people, I never knew you. The demons, when the, the, the false well, disciples tried to cast out demons, the demons said, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? I don't know who you are. This idea that religion doesn't do anything. It doesn't connect you to God. There's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And if you do not have Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved, but just Christ Jesus. If you're trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ for your salvation and your forgiveness of sins, then you are not known by God. And that time will come and you say, well, I went to church and I did this. And I... No, the only way to heaven is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, is to believe that he is the Lord, that they confess with their mouth that he's Lord and believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead. We're all sinners. There's nobody perfect. And the wages of sin is separation from God. Yeah. That's Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.28. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his love towards us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. But if you will confess that he's Lord and repent from your sins, turn from your wicked ways, trust in Christ, 
your sins and be washed away. You'll be forgiven. It's the only way. Well, Jehoram didn't have that way. And so he goes to Elisha in need. And Elisha says, what do I do to you? Oh, you really need help. Go to these other gods. Like, what happened? They're not there to help you. It's a little bit of Elijah with the prophets of Baal, a little bit of sarcasm in this. Uh, oh, now you want God to help? Now? And then he says an interesting thing in verse 14. Um, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even help you. I wouldn't be there for you. Um, so Elisha's tough. It's reminding me of Genesis 18 when Abraham goes to God talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, what if there are 50 good men with the spirit? God says, good. And he says, what about 40 and 30 and 20 and 10? Um, well, this is one good man, Jehoshaphat. And that's where we become the salt and the light in our families, in our uh, employments, in our, our uh, community, that, that word's darkest is where the light of a Christian can really shine. Uh, bringing Christ with you and bringing the truth with you. It could be a, a blessing if you would just allow God to use you in those situations. And so Elisha, because of the faithfulness of Jehoshaphat, he, um, he answers this prayer. And he asks an interesting thing. He says, bring me a musician. Uh, so I, I want to correct myself on something that I, I've said in the past. And I, I still hold to it. Um, a true worship is the response of the blessing from God. And I've heard that, you know, it's said many occasions that worship prepares you for the message. And I think it's the opposite. I think the message prepares you to worship. You can come into God unsaved, come to God. If you're not saved and you're singing worship songs, are you really does it mean anything? And then the message is preached, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And then all of a sudden, you're ready to to uh, to really worship because God has now saved you. And then that worship becomes sincere worship. Uh, but here we do see music played in preparation of getting this word from God. Um, so he plays music. Um, here's what the Bible says about music in Ephesians 5. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the word of the Lord, will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ admitting to know one another in the fear of God, as Ephesians 5, 17 through 21. So we're instructed to sing and, and, and raise spiritual music. Uh, it's important. You should have the right music, good, godly, spiritual music. And, and this musician comes and plays, and this is the process that Elisha is using. And it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Thus saith the Lord, you will not see wind, nor is she rain, yet the valley will be filled with water, so that your cattle and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hands. So they go to Elisha and they say, man, we're going to die. Orem is set. Jehoshaphat says, let's go inquire of a man of God. And the man of God says, I don't even know who you are. Why do I help you? You've got your other gods. You don't worship the true God. You don't have access to his throne. And if you're not a Christian, you don't have access to the throne of God. You can pray all you want, but they're just not, not, not registered. And he agrees to help because Jehoshaphat is there. And that's where we can make intercessory prayer. For those who don't pray, we can pray for the salvation of our loved ones who wouldn't pray it themselves, but we can. And so God gives him this answer. He tells him to dig a bunch of ditches. And he says, look, at this is a very 
simple matter in the sight of the Lord. This is an easy fix. So Horam is, is devastated. We're going to die. We're going to die. And he says, no, this is easily taken care of. You're going to attack every fortified city, verse 19, and every choice city. And you're going to cut down every good tree and stop every spring of water and ruin every good piece of land with stone. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came by the way of Edom and the land was filled with water. So the miracle of this water doesn't come from the sky. Uh, it probably came in a matter of a flash flood. Some have recommended, suggested that it rained in the hills somewhere. A flash flood came and just filled all these holes with water. And they were able to, to have this water. But remember, uh, in a really interesting sermon on this chapter, and I won't take credit for it because the speaker was very eloquent in, in the fact of digging ditches is hard. They had to prepare for the blessings of God. And you've got to be prepared for the blessings of God. And you've got to do the ditch digging. That ditch digging is your studying and your praying and, and your preparation and, and studying to show yourself approved unto God. And you've got to dig in there. There's work to do. The blessings of God come. I know the Ecclesiastes says a dream comes through much activity. You got work to do. You want to be blessed. Uh, you got to get out there in Nineveh day and be in the hot sun, delivering those bags to the car in order for you to feel the blessings of giving. Uh, it takes work. You got to dig into your pocket and give that money that maybe you don't think you can afford. All right. You've got to drive that person to the hospital. You got to go to that place to pray. Um, laziness doesn't, you know, doesn't work. You got to dig, got to get in there and dig. They dig these ditches and they were ready. When the water came, they had done the work and the water's filled. And uh, I kind of like that, that take on this. Um, so when the Moabites heard that the king had come up to fight them, all who were able to bear arms and older were gathered. They stood on the border ready to fight. Verse 22, they rose up early in the morning and the sun was shining on the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, this is the blood. The kings have surely struck swords and killed one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoil. So they look and they see all of these ditches that were big. They filled with water. Now, because of the way the sun was shining and, and the red stones, and the dirt of that valley, it just looked like everything was red. Well, it hadn't rained, so they wouldn't assume it was water. They didn't know that God had miraculously filled these ditches with water. And they didn't even know that there were ditches there. All they saw was red liquid. And their assumption was that these three separate kingdoms finally turned on each other. And they were just going to go now and take the spoil, not knowing that there were armies there. So they came to the camp of Israel, verse 24, rose up and attacked the Moabites. So they fled before them and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. Then they destroyed the cities and each man threw a stone on every good piece of land and filled it. And they stopped up the springs of waters, cut all the good trees, but they left stones of ker intact. However, the slinger surrounded it and attacked it. And so they did exactly what God told them to do. They went in. And they threw rocks, ruined the land, did all that they were supposed to do. And they were victorious. God gave them the victory. The king of Moab got a little desperate, verse 26, as the world does. Saw the battle was too fierce for him. He took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through the king of Edom, but they could not. So he took his eldest son, who would have reigned in his place, and offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against this So in desperation, this horrible king of Moab actually sacrifices his son, thinking his God, and we read about Shemosh, was, was angry at him. World religion, it just doesn't work. Well, that produced great indignation against Israel, people, 
were so angry that that the king had to do this. And what a horrible sight it was to see and to watch and witness. Well, they departed from him and returned to their own land. And we saw with that Moabite stone that they used that in their history as, as Shemos returning, actually answering them from the sacrificed son. Um, but again, they're way off. We'll see that more later. Um, but the world is just left to their debased minds. They, they, they reject the simple gospel. They accept cult after cult and weird religion after weird religion. And they accept, uh, you know, soothsayers and fortune tellers, people who talk to the dead and, and all kinds of, of weird uh, fake religions. Um, and they're wrong. We see in this chapter that, that we are placed in this world, surrounded by false religions, by the world. And, and when they get in trouble, they may turn to you and you can be ready to point them to the man of God, Jesus Christ, uh, to the real truth. And then God can do anything. He can fill those ditches with water. We're gonna talk Sunday about miracles. And, and does God still do them? And, and how can we be part of that? And God can do anything. And he does this and he gives great victory uh, only because of the presence of God through Elisha and Jehoshaphat. These two men were outnumbered by the world and false religion, yet God empowered them and used them to do great victory so that he would get the glory. We could do the same for you. I pray that you'll trust in God and allow him to use you in every situation. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Help us to be a Jehoshaphat, be an Elisha, to be able to connect with you, to see where you want us to go, and to be willing to dig the ditches you tell us to dig in order to see the blessings and miracles of God in Jesus' name. God bless you. I hope you have a great day, and we will talk to you soon.